السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليكم بسم الله الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على السيد المرسل I apologize to Sheikh Omar and the organizers I went to get a cup of tea and it's all tough Hussein's fault he was warming up I said I have an hour to go get this cup of tea and he took less than an hour so in my five minutes I just want to change a little the topic was the the moral superiority of the divine message. So I don't want to talk about any superiority. Uh, superiority manifests itself clearly. I want to talk about the virtue of the divine message. So no one could say I came here as a Sharia supremacist and disregarded and trampled on the good and other ways of thinking and doing and being. One of the virtues of the divine message is that it is a moral message, meaning it has a criterion for distinguishing between right and wrong. That's the essence of morality, a foundation, a way, a criterion to distinguish between right and wrong, between halal and haram, between wajib and haram, what's obligatory, what's forbidden. What's, what's lawful, what is unlawful. And that's a virtue. That's a virtue because it's a clear message. Our society, one decade they say something like, alcohol is forbidden. The next, day, next decade they say, no, it's okay. Prohibition, no, we have to end prohibition. Islam says permanent prohibition is clear. There's no ambiguity. And so, and it says, why is it forbidden? Because it is harmful. We allow things that are not harmful, that are harmful to be lawful, and we forbid things that are beneficial based on the interests of individuals or groups. The divine message privileges no individual and it privileges no group. It says this is forbidden because it's harmful, this is lawful because it's beneficial. And if you relate to it on that basis, any individual within any group is welcome to embrace it. In my two minutes remaining, I'll give you another example. Islam says it is forbidden to kill innocent, non-combatant human beings. And it's a grave prohibition that if you kill an innocent person, it's as if you've killed all of humanity. That's permanent. That's forever. There was one time when other systems say that's forbidden, such as St. Augustine and his concept of a just war and the thinking that developed from that. And then they say no. With the nature of modern warfare makes it incumbent and imperative that you slaughter innocent human beings by the hundreds of thousands, if not the millions. And so you get people theorists like General Billy Mitchell developing theories of aerial bombardment where they know that hundreds of thousands of people will perish as they did at Hiroshima or Nagasaki or during the firebombing of Tokyo or the firebombing of Dresden or Berlin and they said that's justified and then they invent a term to clean it up as collateral damage as if human beings can be reduced to some dehumanizing catchphrase no, this is always forbidden. Someone will say, well, Muslims kill innocent people. They bomb innocent people. They might do it, but they don't do it with the sanctioning of Islam. They don't do it with any legal thinking that emanates from Islam. They don't do it with any moral support and substantiation for us from Islam. So much so that the Prophet wasallam, he mentioned that the murderer لا يقتل القاتل حين يقتل وهو مؤمن that when the murderer murders he does not remain a believer during the time of that crime so yes Muslims do it 
but they don't do it with any sanctioning from Islam. So it's, it's permanent, it's unchangeable, it's immutable. And brothers and sisters, we have to hold on to that standard. Because if we let it go, if we say, oh, you can murder people and Islam justifies it. If we say, no, you can drink, prohibi prohibition's old fashioned. And it's economically detrimental to your community. People could be making so much money selling alcohol and running, running nightclubs and bars. If we let go, then what do those people who are searching for relief from the damage that's caused by alcohol in this society, what hope do they have? When tens of thousands of people are murdered, are, are killed rather on the highways by drunk drivers every year, when most of domestic violence and the, the dysfunction that emanates from that is associated with alcohol, when people say, I'm tired of that, I want something I can hold on to, I want something I can believe in, I want something that's permanent, that's unchangeable, that's going to be a moral rock for me to stand on and build a dignified life on, if they can't look at the Muslims and say, I want to be like those people, who can they look at? And what hope will they have? <laughs> Sisters, hold on to your hijab. The Christians had hijab. It's gone. The Jews had hijab. Some of them maintain it by the women. They wear wigs. So their real hair is not shown. But they lost it by and large. And they lost it because men told them, we want, to, uh, we want to see another image of femininity. We want, it, we want you to let it all hang out, baby. We want to be able to satisfy our lust. We want to transform you from a dignified human being, from the mother of civilization, from the, from the nurturers of human generation, to the object of our lust. Sister, don't allow yourself to be dignified in such a manner. And once, if Muslim women let go of hijab, what community on the face of this earth will have it? What alternative? We talk about biodiversity. How about cultural diversity? We shouldn't allow ourselves to be steamrolled by this monoculture, dehumanizing regime of exploitation of human beings. We should stand up and say, no. I'm going to give women who are seeking for an alternative to the reigning paradigm a real, true alternative. And if they can't look at you, sister, who can they look at? It's, we are holding on to something precious and we should be willing to fight for it. And, and I'm talking fight at the level of ideas. I'm not advocating physically fighting for it. But if it means that we have to die for it, then we die for it. But we're not going to give it up. Because what we have is something that has saved lives. I wasn't almost always a Muslim. Imam Siraj wasn't always a Muslim. But when I look at the people I grew up with, 90% of them probably are dead now. And they died in ways that had they been a Muslim, many of them, would, by the grace of Allah, and if Allah so willed, many of them would be alive today. They died from drug overdoses. They died from AIDS. Based on, based, both on, through IV transmission of AIDS and through homosexual transmission of AIDS. They died from from uh, car accidents when they weren't in, they were inebriated. They died in fights that were fueled by jahiliyyah, by ignorance. What if they had had a standard of morality that was unchanging, that said alcohol is wrong, but not only said alcohol is wrong, but introduced a system of meditation that we call dhikr, a system of, of, of connecting with our Lord that we call salah, that was talked about powerfully by Sheikh Umar Suleiman. They had a system of connecting with reality as it is. We're going to have to hold on. Our, our Lord, and I'll say one final thing. We're entering into a realm. And our president is one of the greatest 
purveyors of this way of thinking where truth becomes relative. As his spokeswoman said, you have your facts and we have our facts. There are no relevant, relevant facts, there are only objective facts and there's falsehood. Our Lord tells Allah, we're taught by our Prophet, one of the things to pray for, Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqan, warzukna tiba'a, show us truth as the truth and bless us to follow it. So not only bless us to recognize truth as such, wa arina al-batila batilan, warzukna ijtinaba, and show us falsehood as falsehood as such, but to make a moral commitment to follow the truth and to avoid falsehood. We're entering into an era where truth becomes relative. When truth becomes relative, if we don't have a permanent standard for understanding and recognizing truth and, ultim uh, and recognizing ultimately there's a big T truth called God, called Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the source of all truth, then we will be entering into a world that will usher in our demise as a human species. They can now reproduce a speech. They can take my voice patterns. They can take an image. They can do a computer re recreation of a speech where I'm saying all kinds of crazy, unacceptable things. And if we don't have a means to cut through that and to understand that cannot be truth and to follow the injunctions where some a perverse source brings some information to you then ascertain the truth of it then brothers and sisters we're in deep trouble we have a responsibility to humanity during this coming age we have a responsibility one of the things our community I was listening earlier we have a great two great things not necessarily based on here and now in terms of the Muslim community here and now in historical terms and we have to learn to look at historical terms we have to have a broad vision we have to be able to look far far back into the past to see what patterns have sustained us so we could reach the present and we have to be able to look into the future to see what's coming down the pike as they say so we can understand what do we have that's valuable that we have to hold on to at all costs if we look at the history of this ummah, Islam has been the greatest force in human history to put, to turn people away from intoxicants. This is, I'm not saying this, this is what Arnold Toynbee, one of our greatest non-Muslim historians has said in his book, Islam and Civilization, that Muslims can offer the West a solution to the problem of alcohol and associate that with that with drugs and alcohol intoxicants and there are many virtues that come up we have that solution even here by and large recently you saw the study of not even small amounts of alcohol are what does such study say are safe even small amounts of alcohol are not safe and then they listed the countries that had the least alcohol consumption every single one of them was Muslim. Every single one of them was Muslim. That's something we can offer our society at this time when opioids are destroying our nation. Alcohol is destroying our nation. The wars to fight over who will sell the opioids and alcohol are destroying places like Mexico and Colombia. The second thing he said was a solution to the race problem. Look how in this country, how pernicious and stubborn and nagging the problem of race is. It was there at the very beginning when the Constitution declared that the black African descent slave was three-fifths of, of a human being. It was there 50 years or so years later when a civil war was fought ultimately over the issue of slavery which was rooted in the question of race. It was there at the beginning of the 20th century, the break, uh, the 
uh, intra, uh, the advent of the 20th century when W.B. Du Bois, the great African-American sociologist, said the problem of the 20th century would be the problem of the color line. It was there when Brown versus the Board, or, and a few years before that, Plessy versus Ferguson, separate is equal, an issue of race. Brown versus the Board of Education, an issue of race. Newark, New Jersey, right here in Philadelphia, North Hartford, Connecticut, Los Angeles, Watts, Detroit, burning to the ground over riots that were called what? They were called race riots. And here we see right now, today, as, as the, the, the racist and the white nationalists, not to deny the progress the nation has made. But when someone can be elected president and they start their campaign with an overtly racist, uh, whatever you want to stratagem, this problem is still a serious problem. When Barack Obama couldn't be a back president, he couldn't do anything about mass incarceration. Or they'll say, see, he's a black president. He's not serving the entire country. We have a problem of race. Arnold Toynbee said Islam has solved the problem of race. Historically peace speaking, not saying this or that Muslim country today, they have racism, they have color consciousness, but they don't have cemeteries where someone won't bury a black man in that cemetery fearing that he'll go out of business. Brothers and sisters, be proud of what you have and hold on to it. Make it better. We can sell the masjids. I went there and they discriminated against me. Make it better. Make the masjid better. Be the solution that the world, that the country is crying out for. Unrecognize the great gift that you, have, that you possess. And as, if you ask Imam Siraj, where would he be without Islam today? I don't know where I would be. I'd probably be dead. I definitely would be, would be misguided. I would have squandered my life, drifting from pillar to post. Wherever the winds blow, that's where I would, go, would have gone because I didn't have the anchor of Islam to, to steady my ship in the stormy waters of life. Value what you have. And if you value it, you'll want to share it with others. If you value it, you'll want to share it with others. May Allah give you tawfiq and taysir. Assalamu alaikum. Zakallah khairan Imam Zaid Shakir.